Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the First World War. I am Mike B, and today we're going to be answering a very frequently and commonly asked question about the First World War that's involving the French uniform. Everybody asks the question, why did they wear blue? What was the reasoning behind that? Why did they wear horizon blue as it's referred to? Well, today I'm going to be giving you a visual aid and then explaining kind of briefly what happened um, with the help of an article that I got off the 151st Line Infantry Regiment. Reenacting Group's site, you can Google them, it'll pop up. A lot of good information on there. I'm just going to do an abridged version of what they put out because um, their article goes into a lot more detail. But this should just give you a basically too long, didn't read kind of um, synopsis and abridged version of that lengthy, in-depth article. And um, then you get to see what Horizon Blue actually looks like. And then now you'll understand a little bit more about why it was used. So in 1912, the French military already kind of figured out that their military needed to modernize their uniform from the old uh, iron blue and red pant and red um, or blue and red kepi uniform that you can see right here. And they realized that, you know, gray and khaki and that kind of thing was um, the modern uniform standard because people could shoot at much greater distances than they could before. Now with the new smaller caliber smokeless powder high velocity rifles. So red pants are very, very um, visible and they can, they're very visible from a long way away. So they decided to start modernizing by, by about 1912. So this wasn't a new thing that they went into World War I just going, hey, we're, we're going to wing it. There were already try, um, there were already attempts being made and, and designs happening to replace that older uniform. Now, what they were going with was this um, this tricolored cloth, which is going to be threads that are red, white, and blue, the national colors. So, unfortunately, what happened is um, they realized that the specific sort of dye that was chosen for this it was a synthetic dye that was chosen for this cloth and the red threads was manufactured in Germany. So even though they, they went along with this and they started manufacturing this stuff, it was a very, very slow and inefficient process. They weren't really cranking out that many uniforms. There wasn't a war on at that point yet. And so there wasn't really the need for mass production. So they started just making this cloth. Very little, if any of it survives today, it's a very hard thing to find out. But you can imagine it's kind of like a muted brownish gray color appearing looking thing, but it's also a pretty unique um, uniform to France. So that's what the whole thing, that's how this whole thing started. So in 1914, when war was declared, there was a massive shortage of all materials and uniforms um, for the French military. So the um, Ministry of War instructed the cloth manufacturer Balzan to produce, or Balzan, or I'm sorry, Baslan. I don't know, I probably butchered that, B-A-S-L-A-N. Um, I just misread my own handwriting. It happens pretty frequently. I'm just writing down some notes here. Uh, to produce a lighter shaded blue than the um, current iron blue that you saw in that picture of the early war French uniform. So that early war darker iron blue is what they were called, or what it was called, was consisted of about 10% unbleached white threads and 90% dark blue or indigo um, threads. So that was the material at the time. So this new material consisted um, that the Ministry of Defense said that they wanted it to be a lighter shade. So this new shade consisted of 35% unbleached white wool and then 15% of the indigo wool so they could still use existing stocks that they had uh, for making the earlier uniforms and it wouldn't have been wasted and all that stuff. And then 50% of a lighter shade of blue. So at this point, point um it was people were very desperate to get these um new uniforms fielded and by uh production began in august of 1914 but they still did not have enough at all and there was so much it was an, an exceptional amount of variations at this point they were the standards were there but they, people were trying to produce it faster than what it should have been produced to be make it all uniform so you're going to see a plethora, an endless sh uh, variation of shades and styles and all that stuff. It was a pretty chaotic time during this time period in 1914 to 1915. So um, it, by January of 1915, a very popular magazine referred to, um, I think it was, uh, if I butcher this, I'm sorry, it's L'Illustration, or The Illustration. And it, there was an article or something. I know I'm not fluent in French. I don't speak French. I know all you French guys are going to be upset about that. I tried. Give me an F for effort. Anyway, a um, little joke in there. So it, there was an article that referred to the new gray-blue great coat called Horizon Color. 
And so this is when it kind of started to become known as Horizon Blue, even though that was never the actual official name. The official name was Light Blue. Um, light blue cloth, it wasn't Horizon Blue, but that kind of became a thing that was popular and it still holds true to this day. Uh, Horizon Blue was used in fashion as a term and a color shade in the late 19th century in France and other places, but in a military setting it was never officially called Horizon Blue. So that's a pretty interesting thing. And at this point, between 1914 and um, early 1915, there was such a desperate attempt to get material um, manufactured and France could not keep up, so they decided to purchase and import a bunch from um, Great Britain, the United States, and Spain. And that just increased the amount of variations of colors. There's an example of the British color being way too dark. It was almost like a dark stone gray. And, but they still used it because they needed material for uniforms. It was getting pretty big at that point. The war was exploding literally and figuratively. And so they needed material and they said, okay, wh whatever, we'll just deal with it. And we'll use up that stock. So they used that stuff. You'll see those uniforms pop up throughout the war, especially in older units. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So by March of 1915, uh, it had kind of stabilized. And those, those first couple months in Mar uh, 1915, the French started producing a lot more. And they produced, I think, about 50,000 meters of fabric in those two months, allowing for approximately 600,000 uniforms to be made. And then the production kept going up, so they did not have to rely as much on foreign imports at this, at this point. And they could produce it domestically, and it was also a lot more consistently colored. And then um, by the spring of 1916, what you see me wearing, which is the model 1915 gray coat, uh, is what the most common color is going to look like because they started these manufacturers started really adhering to the um, specifications that were laid forth in November of 1914 for this light blue color. So what you see me wearing is about as accurate uh, a reproduction as you're going to find as far as the construction of the wool and the color of it and the way the sun reflects off of it. So <clears throat> a couple little things. That's that's kind of how this came to be. Is basically a uniform shortage. Um, they it, It's just a weird kind of experience and it was just a weird reason, but now that's kind of what happened. And so this did become the symbol of the poyu or the French soldier in the First World War. And it was worn by Metropolitan troops through 1921 when it was replaced by American khaki. So um, the uniform you see in the Second World War. And so what did the French troops think? About? Well, it's all over the place. There's not really a lot of um, excerpts and stuff, but there was a couple that I found that they said basically some of them were complaining about it, saying, oh, it's blue. They can see us. It's very visible. And then most of them just were indifferent or whatever and um, also there were some and it's also proven even today i'll try to well i can't go to europe at this point but uh anyway apparently when this gets a little bit of mud on it a little bit of dirt it's a natural camouflage color it kind of blends into like a chalky landscape and dirt so it actually acts as a natural camouflage oddly enough it's pr it's a weird optical illusion kind of pattern um of the of and color it's kind of like gray the eye just doesn't want to recognize like you recognize there's something there but it's the least recognized color by the human eye this sort of did the same thing even though in certain aspects of course it's going to be blue like if you're in really thick green lush woods moving around yeah it's not going to be probably the best but as far as trench warfare and stuff like that it was actually not that bad of a uniform and so it was also interestingly adopted by two other um entente powers Portugal and Romania adopted a color very similar to this light blue. So they're wearing that. Um, the Austro-Hungarians wore a pike gray, so it wasn't uh, horizon blue. So that They look similar, but pike gray is a lot darker and a different composition of the colors and everything. So if you're going to be asking about that, that's, there. Um, that's the answer. So anyway, that is pretty much the basic rundown of why the French wore blue in the First World War. It was something that just a perfect storm happened of just logistical nightmares, failures, and just people dragging their feet and not moving fast enough to get this other color produced or source a different um, sort of red dye. But apparently they were settled on this in around 1912 and they said, well, we have to have this. I don't know why they couldn't have just substituted it for something else, but hey, that's probably lost to history. Somebody probably knows, well, somebody does probably know a lot more about that subject than me, but this is what they ended up with is light blue because it was just blue and white threads instead of red, white, and blue. All right, I guess you can just fast forward there. If people want to timestamp that, too long, don't want to watch, go here. But anyway, I, I do appreciate you guys watching. I also had that question for the longest time and then because of that website, which is a great resource for a lot of World War I French um, equipment and 
tactics and just overall history. So check that out. Um, yeah, so I had that question for many years and it does make a lot of sense when you think about it. But uh, I think there's a reason it didn't go past 1921 in most countries. So anyway, it's a more of a symbol now when you see the Royal One French Sol de Poyu, you, you, you say, oh, he's wearing blue. And that's kind of what, it, you know, that's kind of what it is now today. It's just a symbol. It's a thing of the past. But it's also very cool and it's also very hard to get it made correctly. So... But yeah, by about 1916, it was more uniform and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. And then by the end, it's pretty much everybody's wearing this shade of horizon blue. All right, that is all I've got. I'll stop talking in circles now. Hopefully this video didn't go too long, but I mean, I just, I, I bridge this a lot. So, but I do tend to ramble as I'm doing right now. So if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to um, become a supporter of the channel and keep this stuff going, this uh, impression is being funded partially well a lot actually about half by patreon supporters and channel members so if you want to fund this work and get more cool things like this to see more content where i actually show you what i'm talking about instead of just putting pictures up on the screen um patreon is a great way to do that five bucks a month or more on either patreon or channel membership gets you into my discord server which is pretty fun i'm on there every day talking um posting things and learning a lot of things too from my patreon support it's a really fun time i think it's in, in it's a great thing and uh great resource it's a lot of fun too to be honest we have a lot of jokes that go on whatever anyway um if you want to support the channel but you can't do it financially i totally understand that that is not a big deal at all you can still support me by doing the things like you know liking this video sharing this video out is the best way to support me and just you know watching this video alone really helps out you know my um the stuff in the algorithm and whatnot so you are supporting me and just like this video share it you throw a comment down in the comment section let me know what you thought and uh, if you're in the third category and you don't want to support me well you already have by watching this video so i just have to say thank you everybody for watching and we'll see you on the next episode of the first world war